Para da sa mga kwerid Bob Dib, ah Ron Dui, ah Good morning. How's your day, Ben? My name's Rowan. I'm Rowan. Uh, I think my name is. I think that's more like I'm Rowan. Uh, same purpose, different words, ain't it? And in case you're curious, yes, that is not Irish Gaelic or Quelga. It's Welsh. Um, long story short, my maternal grandfather was from uh, Triskeliard. Uh, in Cornwall, I'm not 100% on how to pronounce the name. He died when I was 10, and uh, that's actually part of the story. So, he died when I was 10. I was uh, then uh, some cause Catholic guilt, right? You can't ever say when it'll set in, much like a lot of other things, like certain kinds of depression. But, um, so yeah, it like went on full force when I was about 12. Uh, my father had since remarried. Yes, I said my maternal grandfather. That's another story for another time. But yeah, my maternal grandfather, uh, he was from, uh, Tuskeliard in Cornwall. Died when I was about ten. Both he and that grandmother died the same year. He was the last one to go. Um, of the two, obviously. Uh, and the last of my grandparents to go, shit. My paternal grandfather died... Almost a year to the day before I was born, I've looked up the record, so my father was kind of correct. He insisted the year to the day, but he was off by, like, a couple days. But And uh, that grandmother died when I was three, and I... There are reasons I know that. <laughs> there are reasons I know uh, I remember that I was three when she died, but yeah. Um, so yeah, Catholic guilt. Um... My dad had remarried. We'd moved in with my stepmother from Metro Detroit, which, by which I technically mean Toledo, Ohio. Uh, it's the Gary, Indiana of Detroit. If you've been to Gary in Chicago and you've been to Detroit and Toledo, you understand why this is true. But yeah, uh, so like I said, Metro Detroit to rural Michigan, which is a huge culture shock to say the least. But yeah, like... Of course, granted, in 1992, 93, thereabouts, it would have been just as hard in an urban setting to find sources on how to learn the Cornish language. And, uh, because it's just that, like, you, you just can't find those sources in the States, especially. And, um, you, you only have a slightly better chance of finding it nowadays. And that, I've only found sources in the form of very pricey books on Amazon. Um... You know, like, short of, like, signing up for, like, individual lessons from people. But, yes, so I picked up Welsh, figuring, hey, concession prize, because my grandfather's uh, native language, well, more like a dialect, is kind of this pigeon of Cornish and English that most people in his village spoke at the time. He was born in 1920. Uh, so, uh, uh... I have a shower cap on, because I decided to do a smart thing, unlike last week... Hey, I made it in there on the second go. So unlike last week where I um, did pin curls in the morning with my shower, last night I decided to wash and set my hair before bed. Um, granted, I also did this along with my um, usual Sunday soak in a tub with Epsom salts and usually a perf combination of perfumed bath um, bomb and or bubble bath. It depends on my mood. Sometimes I'll like start the bath bomb and then decide, no, I want bubble bath as well. Uh, but yeah, so I put the shower cap on because I didn't want my hair getting wet again. Uh, so, uh, ah, uh, where was I going with this? I was right. I remember where now. So, speaking of the fact that I speak Welsh and not Cornish, uh, trust me, if you lived in my brain, this would make sense to you why this seemed like a great way to segue into the fact that the term death rock is not, you know, it is not meant what a lot of people have been treating it as for like the last, I'm going to say 15 years. So, uh, for those who may be unawares, uh, if you have found my 
videos via certain Facebook groups, or, like, the four people still using a live journal. <laughs> like, the four remaining live journal goths. You, you troopers, like my friend Yola, <laughs> out in Chicago. It's like, you're one of the fond little troopers. So, yes, um, for, uh, for those of you who, um, may remember that period of goths on the internet, if I seem familiar to you, and like I said, you remember like the Usenet live journal days? Yes, I was one of those death rock revivalists from deathrock.com featuring Mark Splatter, or at least the site was run by Mark Splatter. He uh, it was originally used as an info dump and then like developed a forum like maybe later that year. I don't remember the timeline exactly. I remember I was one of the original forum users, kind of a jackass at the time. Then again, we all were when we were 20. Uh, to varying degrees, of course, sure, maybe you weren't quite as much of a jackass when you were 20 as I was. And you are indeed being truthful in how you remember that. Um, I'm sure in some ways, some people remember me as more of a jackass than I do. But I'm sure there are others who think I was far less of a jackass than I remember. Jackassery is a spectrum. But yes, I was one of those death rock revivalists who was kind of a weenus, give or take certain um, topics. But yeah, that me, you remember correctly. Uh, I have made a glorious transition though, haven't I? Yeah, you know, just in case like you're one of like the three people who wasn't keeping up on that either. <laughs> Cause really, this is like. I, I still will occasionally run into somebody who is not aware of this. And I'm like, really, hun? <laughs> I thought everybody knew by now. Which is why I'm very unprecious about it at times. But that's another story for another time. So then what happens was, uh, yeah, I was one of those death rock revivalists. And in the years since approximately 1998, 99, Y2K... Uh, so yeah, in those intervening years, the term death rock, especially this last 15 years, has come to take on a meaning that may not be necessarily recognizable to those of us who were, like, in the original, original deathrock.com forum. Oh god, there was even the death rock message for, or, uh, email list. It was an email list first, and email lists, um, I think it was one list. Well, uh, one list was one of them. And it got bought by Yahoo. Yahoo merged one list into their into their um, previous Yahoo Clubs format, which was just like kind of a janky ass message board. But they turned Yahoo Clubs into Yahoo Groups when they bought one list and merged them. So, yeah, that's some internet history there. But where was I going? I was looking for my goddamn concealer. Ah, uh, screw it. I'm running late enough already. So. The, uh, the original DeathRock.com thing, that was, that was a thing, wasn't it? And, uh, like, when I first signed up, DeathRock had not really come to, um, refer to a subgenre of gothic rock that is basically, like, shorthand for, because there's, like, right now there's, like, two primary, I'd still call, schools of gothic rock. One is listens to a lot of the Leeds bands, but hopefully puts their own spin on it. And by the Leeds bands, I'm referring to uh, mostly Sisters of Mercy, but also March Violets, uh, Red Lorry, Yellow Lorry. They all kind of have this sound that um, it's kind of hard to pinpoint, but you know, that whole Leeds sound, because all these bands came about at about the same time. Sisters of Mercy was the, uh, I think the first to release a single, but by only a few weeks, because uh, Lori's did a single that same year, which was 1982. Of course, Sisters didn't release a full album until First, Last, and Always, I believe was 85. I think that was 85, whereas, actually, I don't think Lori's did a full-length album for a while. They did a bunch of compilations of singles, but that's, that's... You know, like, technically March of Violets didn't either, but Botanic Verses was a compilation of most of their singles, but it was just kind of treated like an album. Um, I know that was one of my formative albums in gothic rock, so yeah, like, 
uh, the two main schools of gothic rock are listens to the Leeds bands, or, you know, like, huge influence from the Leeds bands. And the second school is huge influence from Christian Death's only theater of pain and maybe some of the more avant-garde kind of early goth bands from the UK. Like, you know, we're thinking uh, Sex Gang Children, we're thinking... Um, we're thinking Virgin Prunes, though they're not from the UK, they're from Ireland, and contrary to what people, uh, do when they're, like, classifying, like, you know, like, various periods of gothic rock, like, Virgin Prunes never once played at the Batcave, but they always get lumped in with Batcave bands. Though, you know, like, when you actually, like, look at the list, the Batcave bands are just, like, incredibly diverse. There's, like, no single way to describe, like, the music that came out of the Batcave and was most associated with that club. But that's another story for another time. That is definitely not the story for today. The story for today was, is, uh, the evolution of the term death rock. So, like I said, uh, death rock tends to be this term, um, for gothic rock that sound, you know, that takes its primary influence from, like, like I said, um, only Theater of Pain, or as I sometimes, uh, say on Argoth, you know, Reddit, um, listens to only Theater of Pain, or O-T-O-P, usually, um, shortened as, and it jacks off furiously. And I'm using a euphemistic form because my previous video, which was just, like, about Dianic Witchcraft, somehow got demonetized, even though it's, like, one of the more benign videos I've ever done as far as topics go. Um, but death rock was a term, like, we didn't see the term death rock in the UK. We saw gothic, we saw gothic rock, we saw, uh, one of the, a couple of the first bands from that post-punk era. It's not a genre, it's an era. It's an era. It's, it's an era, it's an ideology of, you know, like, returning punk to its underground and experimental roots when it became incredibly formulaic, incredibly swiftly, incredibly formulaic and commercialized incredibly swiftly. Screw you, Malcolm McLaren. But there, what was I saying? Yeah, so, uh, that was like Joy Division. I know Susie was one of the earlier bands to be described as such. And yes, I know The Doors were, like, the first band to be described as gothic rock by a member of the music press. And yes, they have been incredibly influential on the development of gothic rock as a genre. So I don't see the reason why people should necessarily separate them from gothic rock. So, I mean, fight me if you want to, I guess. But uh, then what happens is um, the, uh, the thing about uh, death rock was this was the term that came into use in, um, in Southern California, though it was also used as per, um, various oral histories that have been, um, brought up by a number of people, including my friend Katz out in the, uh, L.A. area, who cut his hair for the first time in, I think, three years. <laughs> uh, I think last year? Ah, uh, that was, that was a thing. I wish I was there for the ceremony, but that's another story for another time. Death rock was the term that really came into use out there. In New York, uh, a lot of the bands from that local area that became associated with goth, um, sometimes retroactively, sometimes it's like right there because, you know, like they played the same nights on the same bills out in LA, and the LA bands would play the same nights on the same bills out in New York when they, you know, like tour and stuff. So yeah, like the term uh, that was more in use in New York, uh, we had two terms. Um, most of the bands that are still considered in the realm of goth adjacent now were called, were referred to as No Wave, as an N-O-W-A-V-E with a space in between. So No Wave. It's not New Wave, it's, no, no, we're not that. That's just a new way to commercialize punk. We're, if you're going to call us anything, it's No Wave, right? No way, no wave. No way, new wave, right? So, uh, another term that was really in use at the time was horror punk. Now, if you're talking genre theory, 45 Grave 
a lot of their music has more in common with the likes of the Misfits or Rosemary's Babies, who are from New Jersey. Misfits, obviously, from New York. There are a couple other bigger bands, um, you know, like that didn't involve Glenn Danzig. Of course, Rosemary's Babies didn't either. Like from the New York-ish area that, um, pfft. oh, Plasmatics. That's who I'm thinking of. Plasmatics, Wendy O. Williams. So like, like I said, if we're talking genre theory, 45 Grave has more in common with New York, New Jersey horror punk than they do with, you know, like, Death Rock, as it's since become known. But people still call it Death Rock because of this. So, and a lot of that has to do with the Death Rock revival that occurred circa 1998 to about 2005. And about 2005 is when it really started to wane because it was no longer really underground anymore. That's, like, there are people who are arguing that it wasn't really underground at that point for a few years. But that's another story for another time. So, um, but yeah, like, death rock was the regional term. Um, mostly in L.A., but also to other parts of the Southwest, where, uh, you know, which was, this was the term for, you know, these bands that were, um, that, that were definitely in the post-punk movement, and had some sort of the post-punk ideology. Uh, actually, Hell Comes to Your House. That's the, like, considered, like, the Bible compilation for the, uh, L.A. death rock scene at the time. Like, we've got Eva O. with superheroines. We've got early social distortion, you know, before Mike Ness got to prison. And, um, 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 what? And got really into Johnny Cash. And revamped his social distortion as kind of a psycho billy band but less on the psycho um like i'm thinking like when i'm thinking like psycho psycho billy i'm thinking like guano bats i'm thinking like uh the other one not guano bats son of a bitch where's uh, okay uh, the internet will tell you just like look up guano bats you'll definitely find a find them amongst a list of other psycho billy bands oh no, no, no. I'm thinking scientists. I'm thinking Kim Salmon and the scientists. So, like, like Swampy. Like, they were a bit more on the countryside of Swampy, but they were, like, too old and totally wrong region for the Swampy scene, which was, like, mostly Australian. Though, again, like, we see bands, like, uh, like Release the Bats, the old club night in Long Beach, which they decided to retire it on its 20th year. And I'm like, really, Jen, Dave? Like, you're not going to wait for me to come back and visit even one more time? Come on! Though they do have reunion um, events on occasion. But, <laughs> so what am I whining about, <laughs> right? One of these days I'll have money again. But uh, then what happens? Then what happens is um, things and stuff. Um, so yeah, the Death Rock revival, that was kind of this way to um, reclaim goth for the underground. Because what a lot of people saw at the time as, you know, being... Uh, pitched at, at goth nights in the mid to late 90s especially was um, it wasn't so much the dark wave because Faith in the Muse was associated with the dark wave scene which did kind of like that term kind of was bandied about a little bit um, in the 90s it wasn't in, in as wide use until I want to say at least 20 one when um, 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 Ishker's Guide to Electronic Music when that website came out I want to say 2000 2001 so like when Ishker's Guide first came out um, that was when the term dark wave really proliferated. Yeah, like I said, it was in use, but not as widespread as it currently is, and that had a lot to do with Ishker's Guide. So, uh, so yeah, it wasn't so much the dark wave, because like I said, Faith in the Muse was associated with that term. A lot of bands that ended up on Tess Records and or signed to Project or distributed by Project were considered dark wave at the time. Of course, ethereal or ethereal wave were also term, terms bandied about at the time, though just ethereal was more common in the 90s. Um, that's where you're really getting, like, the deep project stuff, like, you know, black tape. Um, not so much Lisi. Lisi was a bit more dark wave, but again, you know, like us weirdos from Ohio, um, like, uh, um, 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 why am I brain farting? Tara! <laughs> Tara, Tara Van Flower, why did I brain fart? She's, she's a good friend. She's a good friend. We're not as close as I would like to be sometimes, but we're both weirdos from Ohio, so we have to be friends. We gotta stick together, right? And, uh, unlike that other weirdo from Ohio, of whom we dare not speak. But, yeah, um, so, yeah, the, uh, 
the Death Rock revival, we didn't have our beef so much with Darkwave as we had with uh, the fact that, like, um, there were, like, legit bands that were far more electronic than, uh, like, the, like, a lot of things, a lot of events that started out as Gothenites basically became a little more than raves. And while I do have a rant in me, um, that will defend, uh, the existence of Cybergoth as a part of the, uh, the goth subculture in that there is an historic precedent for it. Um, I should link in the description box below, uh, Peter did a website, um, we, he and I aren't, like, close, close, but we know of each other, we've, we've talked on a couple Facebook groups in comments, but, uh, Scathe is an old, uh, screen name he's gone by, he does a really nice, uh, granted it's done in old school HTML, and it's in frames, I miss websites done in frames, I liked frames, but my, uh, my, uh, my, <laughs> my, my dipshitty website preferences aside, uh, he does this really nice oral history of the goth scene in the UK, like, on his website, which, uh, points out that there were synth-pop musicians referred to as futurists in the early 80s. And as a lot of these musicians and bands, so we're looking at Gary Newman, we're looking at, um, Depeche Mode, these were bands that have since become absorbed into the goth music canon, right? Like, whether you like it or not, these are considered, at the very least, goth-friendly bands. So, um, but yeah, his, uh, his explanation on exactly what the Futurists and their music was all about, um, and we're talking, like, the UK, you know, scene here, uh, like, if you accept this as goth-adjacent music, as goth-friendly music, then you logically ought to accept that cyber goth is a legit thing with a precedent to be considered legitimately goth. Like, I, I don't understand who people who don't understand that cyber goth is a thing or who try to argue that it somehow 100% is not, but, um, uh, but at the same time, like, the fact that cyber goth is legitimately a thing, certain... Uh, I'm sure if you went to deathrock.com on the uh, Digital Archive Project and looked up the forum, you'd see even my old screen name saying some jackassery things about how, like, oh, this, this cyber rave stuff isn't real goth. And, you know, yeah, we were all kind of jackasses about it at the time, but most of us from that period, from that specific sub-scene, have since grown up about it and realized, okay, this isn't an us versus them thing, or at least not in this way about this exact thing, because, you know, if you look at, you know, a lot of the music we listen to, like, we were also listening to Japan and Gary Newman, and we were getting excited about Front 242 coming back around because, you know, they were one of the original bands, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> But yeah, like I said, like there's a precedent for cyber goth. So it wasn't so much that it existed that was getting it on our nerves, on our last nerve. It was the fact that it was taking over. So the Death Rock revival was for, uh, was less about a revival of a subgenre than it was about reclaiming the goth scene for the underground. Because you gotta admit, the, uh, the cyber rave stuff is a lot more mainstream friendly as dance music. Uh, yeah, I really gotta put some tux into this skirt, like real ones, but I'm in a hurry. I put it off all weekend, and now it is club day, so I kinda gotta do what I gotta do, right? Uh, but yeah, then what happens? So yeah, like, our beef wasn't so much that cyber goth existed, it was that it was taking over. It was that, like, it was kind of, though not necessarily, though some clubs did um, explicitly invite more mainstream kind of crowds who would come in and, you know, just like be tourists and gawk at the, you know, freaky people in black. And we, this is where we get a lot of stereotypes 
about you know the uh, the, the 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 big titty GF. Like this is where it all originated. That whole big titty GF who's in all the kinky shit. Like that's where this shit originated. And that's why the Death Rock revival was kind of necessary. It, like I said, it wasn't so much about the fact that Cybergoth was a thing, it's that it kind of became the only thing. And it kind of became what defined the goth scene in a lot of places. Like, <laughs> like these days I do kind of get nostalgic for Front... or not Front 2, for 2, V&V Nation. They were a really big band at the time. They're still kind of big. They're one of my best ex's favorite bands. Them and Fields of the Nephilim. And that may make no sense to you if you are, like, hardcore death rock. Though, I've still got to, like, I don't know. I'm going to reshoot part one and then resume my series on how, um, Fields of the Nephilim is kind of this enigma. But if you think about it, Fields of the Nephilim and Front 242 really do make sense as a person's two favorite bands. But, like I said, that's kind of another story for another time. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't so much that Cybergoth existed. It was about the fact that it was kind of taking over, and it was just kind of, you know, the thing that was defining the goth scene in a lot of places. Like, to the point where a lot of bands that were playing just even a couple of years before had a hard time getting gigs at goth nights because, you know, the crowd was looking for less faith in the muse in their, you know, synth-infused dark and spooky music, then they were looking for VNV Nation, even though these bands were both com comparatively big in Europe. <laughs> One was definitely bigger in the U.S. Actually, you know, it depended on which crowds you ran with for which bands seemed bigger in the U.S., but they were both really big at about the same time, but there were certainly regions where Faith and the Muse had a harder time getting gigs, because, you know, there was this strict you know, sort of dichotomy that had come about in some local scenes. And, like I said, like, these were two bands that overall, in the U.S. even, uh, were equally big. I think they were actually bigger in Germany. Because, uh, Belgium! Belgium is where EBM came about. Um, that's where we get Fr Front 242, uh, Poisset Noir. Um, and I know I'm pronouncing that really oddly. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, like, EBM was Belgium's gift to goth. I, I will say that much. Because, uh, because, yeah, like, a lot of the futurists also enjoyed, you know, Front 242 and Poisset Noir. As did a lot, let's be honest, a lot of the New York goths, because that's kind of where the term came into popularity in the U.S. And so, like, because of the no-wave connections with, like, Nick Cave, uh, Roland S. Howard, and Lydia Lunch, Lydia Lunch being a New Yorker, a couple other New York people were really, um, you know, getting involved with uh, Nick Cave and stuff. But, yeah, like, so there would be some cross-pollination. That's kind of how uh, the term goth came to Australia and replaced the term swampy when there is indeed news media that, as, re as late as 1989, I believe, swamps and gothies were considered two distinct scenes. But, yeah, there was kind of a similar thing <laughs> going on in Australia, like, the decade before, where Swampies and Goths were kind of, you know, two competing scenes, though many bands had the same audiences. So, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a weird thing. But yeah, so, um, so yeah, like, how Death Rock came to be associated with a specific sub-style, I suppose, if we're talking genre theory, of Gothic Rock, I think that had a lot more to do with the death of Ross Williams in 1998 than it did with this being anything more than a culturally distinct school of gothic rock. That's where I see it happening the most anyway, was like, this is where I start seeing this emerge. And this is where, like, the, uh, the, the adage that Roz Williams has some of the worst fans at one time, I was one, but thankfully I grew the hell up and got my head on straight. It's the only thing about me that's straight, but that's another story for another time. Um, but yeah, I want to say that's about where we see um, Death Rock equals this stylistically distinct school of Gothic Rock. Whereas, like I said, Gothic Rock seems to be by certain people who will nitpick genre 
And though there are other people who will nitpick genre, like Cadaver Kelly, who she and I have shared comments saying that, yeah, Death Rock really is not distinct in terms of genre theory from Gothic Rock, because it's got, like, all the important elements. It's just more like, at best, it's like a culturally distinct style that originated in a different part of the world that, and that, like, cultural difference has had less and less relevance with time, though you could argue that there is still sort of this, um, hardcore anarcho-punk vibe and loose associations, because that's kind of how Christian Death came about. Um, you know, a bunch of members, along with Roz Williams, were initially read as a part of the uh, hardcore punk scene out in Los Angeles area. Like, that was kind of what they said until, like, you know, a bunch of them who were into horror and darker subjects and The Doors <laughs> and Alice Cooper and all of that. Like, that's, like, you know, so all of those theatrics and the darkly, you know, mystical kinds of topics. That's where, uh, that's kind of how the term Death Rock came about. And that is not hairspray. And that is not hairspray. And this is hairspray. Death Rock, like I said, it's not really distinct as far as genre. At best, it's got a distinct style. It's got a distinct sort of um, ethos behind it. But until about 1998-99, Death Rock was just like the regional term, like the original regional term for goth and goths. Like in, in most of the states, but especially uh, Southern California and the Southwest, though arguably like all along California. Um, like I said, until about like 97, 98, and then even then, like largely on the internet, like goth was, or death rock was the regional term for goths. Um, like I said, it was mostly California and the Southwest, though it did kind of, um, I used the term death rocker as a small town kid in the Midwest like, even just before Marilyn Manson hit mainstream, like, and, um, and, um, 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 and, like, Peter Steele of Typo Negative, like, dude, that guy gets, does not get the credit he deserves from a lot of people on, uh, our goth on Reddit, uh, because, like, when you were a kid in, like, with the flyover states in the mid-90s, and you were into, you know, goth and death rock, um, you, uh, Peter Steele was, like, one of the, uh, the bastions of genuine, eh, representation of the, uh, of the goth subculture at the time that you had access to. Like, we would, we would gather around the television at one person's house, uh, after school, um, to watch him whenever he'd go on, you know, the talk show circuit, like Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and couple other people, but I remember him on Sally a couple times in specific, and I'm sure you can find um, various clips of that on YouTube, as you do. And I never n remember what my favorite brush for doing glitter is, but oh well, let's, let's try this one. And I, I can easily argue that there are a bunch of typo negative songs that are more easily defined as gothic rock than any kind of metal, at the very least. Like, you cannot tell me that Be My Druidus, as a quick example off the top of my head, because I heard it most recently, like, you cannot unconvince me that that song is not much closer to gothic rock than any kind of metal. Like, <laughs> it, 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 it just is. That's just a fact of life. And if you don't like it, then it's okay to be wrong, but... Like, doubling down on your own wrongness is just wrong, right? But, uh, yeah, I'd say their Death Rock revival period had, uh, had a lot to do with this. Um, especially when there were a bunch of stupid super fans like myself, um, kind of, like, thoroughly associating the term with the music of Roz Williams. And, like, some people even went so far as to say Roz Williams coined the term, but I see no evidence to support that he was the first person to use that term, like, in any sort of way. 
It's quite possible he was the first amongst his particular group of friends to do so, but I, 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 I just it just did not seem like something that is provable at all. Like, there's no probable cause to believe that he invented that term. But at the same time, like, this was also, like, around, like, 20, like, 2000 to 2005 was around the time where we see this proliferation of people on the internet trying to classify different styles of goth, which did kind of start as a thing, but when I say that, I mean, this was just kind of like a, kind of like a tongue-in-cheek uh, ribbing that us old farts on Usenet would use to kind of, like, explain the, the diverse range of tastes amongst the gothic subculture. So, and I think that's kind of where, that's kind of where some people attempted to be um, historians and um, genre nerds and all of that, like, started, like, really driving home the idea of death rock as being distinct. But, see, the thing is, if you were in Southern California in 1983, of, like, this was the same year that um, um, Catastrophe Ballet came out, like the Christian Death album, which sounds nothing like only Theater of Pain. Like, if you were going to talk genre theory, Catastrophe Ballet is a, uh, is a dark cabaret album with a lot of pop elements to the songwriting. Ashes is a straight-up dark cabaret album, but Catastrophe Ballet is kind of in this alternative pop sort of sound, like uh, Susie Sue on the Hyena album, which I think came a little later. Like I said, it's kind of got these pop elements, but it has hella influence from um, 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 yeah, the cabaret scene, and uh, I'm pretty damn sure uh, Roz and uh, Andy Sex Gang were friends at a time, and Andy Sex Gang has been variously described, though often, quite often, by um, Ian Asbury of the cult as being a huge fan of Edith Piaf, and we also know Roz Williams at a point got into Edith Piaf. He also got into uh, Billie Holiday via Jeton Damon, who's, you know, like, primary um, instruction as a singer is as a jazz singer. So, yeah, like... <laughs> Oh god, I, I love it when people are like, Dark Cabaret is not, is like, it's only goth adjacent. I'm like, honey, you're only saying that because you weren't at, like, um, at, at a club with no name out in L.A., like, circa 1983. <laughs> like, because that was, like, the beginning of Roz's Dark Cabaret era, uh, which he would return to in the mid-90s with... You know, the split album with Jeton Damon. Uh, but yeah, like, this was the beginning of Roz Williams' like, foray into dark cabaret music, right? So if you were, like, at a club with no name, you'd see all the goths and, you know, gothic rockers, you know, from the UK, you know, who were there on holiday for whatever reason, and you'd see the local death rockers, and they'd all go to that, you know, dark cabaret period uh, Christian death concert, right? <laughs> so, yeah, like, dark cabaret is a genre that has literally always been in the goth subculture. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but, you know, like I said, it was 1983 in L.A., so of course this was a death rock show. It's got members of the death rock scene, you know, at the show, like, performing in it. Like, not only is this, you know, for the local death rock scene in Southern California, in Phoenix, Arizona, in... Um, Las Vegas, where Eva O's originally from, like, this, this, this was, of course, a death rock show, because it's got death rockers in the band, it doesn't matter what kind of music they're playing, they're death rockers, this is a death rock show, right? <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I, I, I really believe a lot of the, uh, Ros Williams diehards in the, um, early knots were a huge reason that we've come to associate the term death rock with gothic rock, but their primary influence isn't so much the Leeds bands as it is only Theater of Pain. So there's that going on, right? Yeah, so I I'm saying this because it's, uh, it's an old school night tonight at uh, what passes for a goth night around here. They play a lot of like newer dark electro that... I really got a squint to say that this is anything like the industrial that was deeply intermeshed with the early goth scene in the 80s in, you know, like, not just the UK and Europe, but also in the States. Like, 
Front 242, like, people would come to those shows. Sometimes they'd even be on the bill with local band superheroines, right? <laughs> or, you know, local band uh, Rosemary's Babies out in, you know... I mean, I don't know, for example, if that was indeed a shared bill, but it, it would happen. It would happen. Like, people were a lot less strict in the 80s through early to mid-90s about, like, putting, like, these strict genre, you know, like, codes on the bands that could play the same gig. There are some places in the U.S. and um, the U.K. and Europe where they still aren't so strict about, like, putting these, you know, like, strict genre coding on the bands, but, you know, on, on the same bill, but it does happen more than it ever did in the 80s, because in the 80s, like, we were all into the same music, it's just some were more into this than this, so, like, people who insist that industrial never had anything to do with goth and or death rock, I'm just like, honey, in the 80s it was all about, like, which one you were more into, not, like, you know, it, there was no strict divide between the subcultures at the time, that really came about in the 90s. That really did come about in the 90s, and I don't know exactly what sort of cultural shifts made that come about that way, but it, did, it didn't really happen until the 90s, because like I said, like, in the 80s, like, you weren't a goth versus rivet head based on what you listened to, it's like what you were most into, because you kind of listened to a little bit of everything, right? You know, like, if we see this, if you see, like, the KMFDM album, you're like, oh my god, that just, that looks like some straight-up Cold War propaganda poster trolling on there. Oh my god, I'm gonna check this out. You know, or Leibach. Oh my god, Leibach is so great with Cold War, you know, era, you know, crypto-fascist trolling, right? I love Leibach for that reason. A lot of goths, especially my age and older, love Leibach for that reason. So, uh, so yeah, like, that's kind of, like, how it all came about as, like, this distinct sort of thing. But when you run into older people like myself, like even Angela Benedict, like, I don't know why she has the reputation she does for being, like, this strict divisionist when, like, if you actually, like, listen to what she's saying in her videos, she's made no such claim. But okay, you know, like, 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 also older people like myself, like Angela, like, oh, like a lot of people, let's be honest. Like, I've even seen, like, Skullgirl, like, Skullgirl has talked about, like, how she listens to, uh, brain farting. So I'm just gonna say KMFDM because... I'm one of those people where it's just like, if you don't like KMFDM, I wonder who harmed you, right? <laughs> They're just one of those bands, right? Like, if you're involved in dark music and you don't like at least one KMFDM song, I wonder who harmed you, right? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I don't hold it against you, but I just, like, wonder what the hell, right? <laughs> that just seems so odd to me. And... Like, yeah, they're one of my favorite industrial bands, but I wouldn't say they're one of my favorite bands ever. You know, because I've also DJed. I've also DJed a bunch of times. And I should get going, find my... Actually, no, it's... Uh, I got another ten minutes. But, um... So, yeah, like, that's... This is kind of, like, more like the, a rough timeline for how this all came about. Because I don't know exactly the hows or whys. I'm not a sociologist on subcultures. I've I've heard oral histories and read, you know, what works out being an oral history. But yeah, it's like, I know the oral histories, and I know about, you know, the timeline for this. And we really didn't start seeing this huge divide between, like, you know, goth and cyber goth slash rivet head until about the mid-90s. I don't know exactly why, but I think a bit of it had to do with the sudden popular, the sudden mainstream popularity of Marilyn Manson, and he was considered a bit more on the heavy metal side of industrial, like, even when the band was called Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids, and he was, like, making tapes and passing them out to people at Tampa, you know, Florida, because, you know. <laughs> I swear, there is, like, a, a Michigan, Ohio to Florida exchange program going on. I've known so many people in the, you know, goth and industrial scenes, you know, or, you know, the club scene, because in Michigan, Ohio, it is like the same club scene. Um, but yeah, like, I know so many people, like, going, you know, who are from Michigan or Ohio who go, you know, who've been, like, had some years in Florida and then ended up back here. So there, there's got to be some kind of exchange program going on. But, you know, he got out of both for some reason. Like, that is about where I see this, like, really taking off. So it's like, you know, Marilyn Manson, who's always been on the more, like, heavy metal side of industrial. And that's a thing. Like, you see bands like Gravity Kills, and um, that's the one big one I can think of. I mean... 
when Nine Inch Nails toured with live bands, sure, you saw that on occasion, too. Um, so yeah, like, Nine Inch Nails wasn't quite as popular as Marilyn Manson eventually got, but, you know, they were kind of in there, they were kind of a little on the mainstream-ish side of college rock, as it was often referred to in the early 90s. At least that's the charts you'd see, like, when you look up at the library, like, old microfiche of old Rolling Stone issues, like, you see the charts in the back of the old Rolling Stone when they were still, like, this big of magazines, and, uh... <laughs> And you go in the back, and it will be like you know, like the Billboard Hot 100, like top 40, and or or top 30 or whatever. And then like the smaller charts of just like 10 of them, like top college rock. Usually it would be college rock. Occasionally they'd do country just to mix it up sometimes, but you know, like or urban, urban, which you know is like always been like music industry code for um, rap, hip hop. Um, new R&B, so not so much the 60s rhythm and blues, like we're talking, like Motown, uh, you know, or even the stuff that was leaning a bit more rock, like the Who or, or early stuff by the Kinks, we're talking like, like the new, um, the new R&B that was, that is musically quite distinct from rhythm and blues, but you can definitely hear some influences, so, uh, so yeah, like I'd want to say it was about the Marilyn Manson period, like when he just suddenly got really popular, like almost overnight. And that's where we start seeing the divide. Now, I don't know if it, like, it's like this reaction that eventually like gave into the uh, Death Rock revival around 98, 99. Uh, I do think that definitely played a part in it, but I can't say that was like the only factor. There was no one single factor in it, but I do think a lot of that had to do with it. Plus, like you had movies like The Crow uh, that were really popular and very mainstream. The Addams Family came out, out with two movies. So, like, the first one was popular enough to warrant a sequel. And I've got a rant in me about The Addams Family and how the 60s sitcom is far more... gives a far more feminist treatment to Morticia than either of the films do. Trust me, you'll be with me on this when you hear the end of it. But, uh, but yeah, so we see a lot of stuff just, like, getting very, very mainstream and is very popular and, um... Angela, of course, has done a lot of videos talking about experiences as, you know, a goth in the 90s in New York City, which is like, you know, I, yeah, I experienced the club scene in London with my um, eldest half-sister and my brother-in-law, but the school year, I was in, like, a rinky-dink town in the Midwest, in the rural Midwest, rural Michigan, like, um, like, almost halfway between Detroit and Toledo, but, like, kind of off to the side a bit, and, like, my stepmother had chickens, and she was a social worker, and went to a lot of trailer parks, but that's another story for another time. So, like I said, like, you know, we would, we would watch Sally Jesse and look for, um, like, in the flyover states, we would just, like, watch Sally Jesse when we knew Peter Steele was going to be on, because he was our, he, he was, like, our conduit to, like, the genuine dark alternative scene, the genuine goth scene, you know, as it was being called in New York. I mean, yeah, the band was a bit more on the heavy metal side in a lot of ways, but at the same time, there was a lot of influence from gothic rock coming to their music. Like, he even said in a bunch of interviews that were on the radio that I taped to listen to over and over again, but I sensed, like, I did a huge purge of my tapes without even looking at them, and then I remembered, like, a year after that, I was just like, oh, shit. Well, if somebody found those interviews, please put them, like, on Soul Seek or something for me. But, uh, but yeah, like, he would say, like, you know, well, we're not exactly a goth band, but we do take a lot of influence from gothic rock. Like, come on, like, <laughs> you can't get any more, you know, clear than that, that he was absolutely influenced by gothic rock. Peter Steele himself was a goth. I mean, yeah, his most famous band was a lot more on the heavy metal side, but still, it's like, he was a goth. He took a lot of influence from gothic rock when songwriting... And this is very clear in a lot of songs. But, uh, but yeah, it was like this explosion of popularity in the mid-90s that really fostered the late-90s divide. So, like, mid-90s, explosion of popularity. And we all held Marilyn Manson personally responsible for it, even though there were, like, a lot of other things that were just kind of coming into it. But, yeah, like, there are a lot of other things at play, but we all blamed Marilyn Manson for it, first of all. <laughs> and we definitely all blamed Marilyn Manson. That is one thing that goths and underground rivet heads definitely all agreed on was that it's all Marilyn Manson's fault. Somehow. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and then a couple years later, everybody blames Marilyn Manson for something that he had no part in. But okay, whatever. Um, 
<laughs> and then, like I said, it, like a lot of it was reactionary. It was very reactionary against the sudden boom of popularity. And because there was a sudden boom of popularity, there were, you know, like people going to clubs, sometimes underage, like yours truly did in London. <laughs> and a few other people, if you're paying attention to their stories they're telling, right? Uh, and, you know, like uh, some of them even of age. But they're getting into the clubs, and they want to hear this, like, and that's all they want to hear, right? So that's all they want to hear, so that's all, like, a lot of DJs and, you know, who have, like, a smaller scene to cater to are playing. So, like, in the bigger cities, we see the divide come a lot more sharply. We definitely saw it a bit more sharply in London, though at the same time, a lot of people would go to both nights. <laughs> it's just, like, there are some nights cater around like this kind of music if that was in your mood and there were nice cater around this kind of music if that was your mood and sometimes you'd go to both nights in the same night and go back and forth a couple times depending on how late each one was open <laughs> this was a thing that people did okay but like in the smaller scenes in the smaller scenes in the smaller areas in the smaller clubs like this would become the dominant thing was like the doom black gray sad oh my gosh new hit record of the decade that's that's gonna be my breakthrough single but yeah so <laughs> we would see like this would be the dominant thing like if I would occasionally be able to you know get to you know like on like <laughs> be able to sneak my way into a club up in Ann Arbor or, you know, like one of the smaller clubs in Detroit at the time. Um, I didn't start going to City Club back and forth until about 99 uh, Y2K, but that's another story for another time. So if I went to a smaller night in like the Metro Detroit area or one of the really, really rinky dinky nights in Ann Arbor, because I was living around here in rural Michigan, and Ann Arbor was about here, and Detroit is up here, <laughs> right? So if I would get into, like, one of those nights <laughs> on a weekend during the school year, like, this would all be, be there, like, and, like, that's not what I came there for. That's not what a bunch of my other friends and I, you know, were, like, trying to sneak in for. We were sneaking in because... We wanted to, like, you know, like, we wanted to hear electronic music, but we wanted to hear Switchblade Symphony. We wanted to hear, um, you know, synth pop, but we wanted to hear, like, old school, like, Gary Newman. Yeah, like I said, like, that's just kind of about how it drifted. That's the rough timeline for how it drifted. And like I said, we all blamed Marilyn Manson at the time, uh, though his actual involvement in this probably had very little to do with it, all things considered. But it was this catalyst that we noticed that kind of really drove this into like you know like saying like like i said if you like look up the uh old deathrock.com on like way back archives and you look at the old forum there are a lot of people saying like oh all the clubs these days are just techno it's like at some point like a lot of clubs that did start as bonafide goth nights did go down this like cyber rave route and you know, like, we were longing for, you know, like, and it's not just, like, we were longing for the good old days. Like, we aren't, we weren't a whole bunch of old farts on the porch. Like, there were young people like myself who were looking for dark music that kind of had this other, like, this wistful, this whimsical, this, you know, like, almost fey folk kind of feel to it. Like, you know, Angela Benedict has described, you know, like, goth music. Like, people have been asked her, like, how to describe, like, goth, like, the goth aesthetic, like the goth oral, um, aesthetic, I'm um, brain farting, you know, like we, we see, we see this drift from, uh, from a very, from a very, like, dreamlike, you know, place, and that's like, kind of like how Neil Gaiman will, like, differentiate gothic fiction and film from horror fiction and film. It's got a lot more to do about the atmosphere, that's it, like this, like this oral atmosphere of whimsy and, you know, like, like, that makes you think that you're, like, in, like, Kate Bush's Wuthering Heights official video from 1979 and all of that. Like, something that makes you feel like you are, like, on the cliffs of Dover and, you know, just, like, waiting for the ghosts of your manor house, <laughs> even though you're one of, like, the downstairs help, right? <laughs> so, yeah, and, and we went to the clubs and... It, it it was this very this very rigid kind of feel to it. It didn't have the same whimsy. It didn't have the same atmosphere. And that's 
why I, you know, that's kind of where it became two distinct scenes and why we blamed Marilyn Manson, I think. Um, because, you know, it was this very different atmosphere. It was this atmosphere that was very nihilistic rather than dreamy. You know, it was this, it was this and I'm not saying goths are necessarily optimists. I'm saying that we're definitely not nihilists. <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm saying we're less nihilistic than we are existentialists. Like, we would rather ponder existence than, you know, like, than, than find all of the ways it's all going to go to, you know, down the crapper, right? We, we, we would rather think the big questions. We would rather, you know, like, we would rather dance on the cliffs in the fog and, you know, like, with our cats and ferrets because... Uh, ferrets were the original witch animal of Greek mythology. Cats were far more associated with uh, Aphrodite than they were with Hecate. Hecate was associated with the witches. Hecate was associated with ferrets. People say polecat. People see polecat in translation, and I'm like, no, polecat is a word for weasel. You know, like and and that whole like ferret mustelid family. That's what polecat means. <laughs> like polecats are ferrets. <laughs> They're not cats, right? It, it's. <laughs> You know, pole, cat, you know, like, they're, it's saying it's cat-like, but it's also like a pole, right? It's ferrets, it's weasels, it's mustelids. So, like, ferrets are the other witch animal. I don't know how it became cats, but we don't see that until about medieval Europe. Um, I think it had a lot to do with Norse. I think it had a lot more to do with Norse mythology, because uh, Freya, Freya is associated with cats. Freya is also associated with witchcraft. But, uh, but yeah, <laughs> third time I've tried signing off. And, uh, as always, wear your sunscreen and otherwise take care of yourselves. Uh, as always, you know, thumb icons in the lower left. Um, I think your left is this side. Uh, thumb icons in the lower left to denote your enjoyment or lack thereof with all of my nonsense. Uh, subscribe bar down in the lower right, along with a little bell notification if you want to see more of this nonsense that I talk about in my bathroom as I'm getting ready to go out, hopefully, for a change. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, if you have more dollars than cents, as I tend to say, I've got a PayPal, uh, tip jar below in the description box, as well as... Um, Patreon, uh, while I'm bringing out Patreon, thanks so much to my Patreon supporters, Ali Valkyrie, and, uh, uh, who is herself a, another polytheist, but she is a writer and activist, and she is also an American expat living in France, and also to another young lady that I know only as Allison, who has been a Patreon supporter of mine since I was a blogger, mostly, in the pegging blogosphere. So, uh, as always, when I wrap up, bats and kisses, and may you have the exact kind of day you deserve to, sweethearts. All right, take care. Bye-bye.